Uh, hey everyone, I'm William Hanley. I'm the web editor for Architectural Record and Green Source magazine. And I'm here with uh, Tom Kundig from uh, Olson Kundig Architects based in Seattle. Tom uh, is known for his projects that range from residential to commercial, uh, multifamily, um, at a number of different scales. And uh, his work combines uh, a, a sense of place with a material honesty and um, a uh, design ingenuity, no matter what the program. And uh, I recently had the pleasure of writing about his uh, uh, Charles Smith Wine Tasting Room in Walla Walla, Washington, which if you've never been is kind of an amazing part of the country. And uh, yeah, so I guess uh, we'll start off the conversation with that. Um, how did you uh, come to do a wine tasting room? Uh, tell us a little bit about the clients and uh, you know, how that works. Well, we, we've been working on wineries for a while now, and, and uh, Charles actually didn't know us. He did not know about our experience with, with wineries, but kind of came to us because of an ad, oddly enough, an ad in a, a flight magazine of a, about a project that we had, we had done a number of years ago. It was a condominium project, and it was for sale. And what he uh, appreciated about what he at least saw initially was that there seemed to be some risks being taken with that particular project. So he did a little bit of research on us in the web and uh, uh, then ultimately hired us to participate in his, uh, his uh, project. Now, those of you that know Charles knows that, know that he is a, a uh, sort of a provocateur in the wine industry and he loves to, to uh, poke a little bit at the, at the, the industry of winemaking. So for him, it seemed like a natural, a natural uh, hook with with us and some of our work. And tell us a bit about the the existing building. It's an old uh, 1920s garage. Yeah, and uh, that has a lot a lot to do with why um, Charles uh, hired us because he he did buy this garage uh, with the intent of sort of leaving it as a garage uh, and. Uh, using it as kind of an industrial background to what, what he does and what he feels winemaking is about. He doesn't feel winemaking is nearly as precious as uh, the industry makes itself out to be. So again, the provocateur uh, about um, in, in his industry. So the garage was a natural choice for him to uh, uh, buy and uh, essentially set up his, his shop. So he really wanted us to embrace kind of the existing existing uh, garage but in a, he had in a two uh, programmatic requirements too he had to have this public tasting room and also an office for his uh, um, his uh, <coughs> whole operation uh, can you say a bit about how you separated the space into those two requirements well his background was as, as a rock and roll imp impresario so he felt that two-thirds at least two-thirds of the space would be given over to some sort of event space and whether that event was drinking wine selling wine or actually having um, uh, uh, music venues or performance venues, um, he would he would be in the position of basically being the impresario of that of that space. But one third of the space was were are his headquarters basically, and he has about seven or eight people that work in this particular building. The idea was to basically take that one third of the space and make it uh, sometimes transparent to that larger performance space, and sometimes. Uh, closed off, depending on what was happening between the spaces. So it was a morphable space, basically, both in t from the inside, from the the office space out to the uh, performance space, and then out to the street. And you did that with this interior box. Uh, can you say a bit about the armadillo? <laughs> yeah, the armadillo is is basically the Trojan horse idea, where something is brought into a larger space uh, as a as an object and could conceivably be moved out of that space. So it doesn't touch the walls, it doesn't touch the ceilings, um, and it rests on the floor. Uh, and so that was basically the idea that it would be base, uh, it would be this um, uh, sort of transformable Trojan horse. And we called it the armadillo only because it sort of opened and closed very, very easily. With these sort of sliding steel yes. panels, which actually is a great segue into um, another project sort of on a, a similar kind of scale. It's a, a uh, brewery project in a uh, in an in, in existing industrial building in Seattle. Can you, you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, uh, yeah, you know, I I do believe, and in, in the office, I, I always um, am saying that I think this is our future 
uh, as architects. Uh, the ground up building um, certainly will still exist, but I think um, our future as an industry and our future as an office is to engage these existing buildings. And they're not always pretty buildings. In fact, they're pretty, in some cases, they're pretty tough buildings. And in this case, I was approached by a couple of um, beer makers, basically, Georgetown Brewery, and Manny and Roger uh, got a you know, a terrific deal on this on this old beat up warehouse. It was not the, the classic romantic, you know, brick uh, uh, brewery at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were a little bit skeptical that they could make something special out of it, but they did uh, ask us to help them with a very limited budget, a very tight budget. How do you make, uh, a, I think it was a 1964 tilt up warehouse, interesting. Not a romantic, uh, no, industrial building. No. Yeah. And, um, so the idea was very simple, but with a limited budget, just how do you take this enclosed box and open it up in a very sort of dramatic way, in a simple way. So you did this corner cutaway entry, and um, can you say a bit, it's a, these are also sliding steel panels? And yeah, these are just bit classic, just barn door hardware. Uh, the panels are huge, obviously, and uh, they become kind of the billboard for, the, for this particular uh, place so that you know when business is open and you know when business is, is shut down. And then so uh, in addition to these uh, sort of small uh, commercial projects, small um, and uh, with some office component, um, you're, you're also working on some residential work which uh, you know is perhaps how you, how you became most known. Um, can you, but uh, you just completed a multifamily building, uh, can you say a little bit about uh, Work, working on that kind of program and using some of the same ideas about a uh, material? Well, natural natural uh, evolution for the firm, you know, we do uh, probably about 60% of our work is, is single family residential projects from very, very small, from 280 square feet for obviously a small cabin to, to, to larger residences with uh, uh, museum uh, art collections inside. This was a sort of a leftover urban space in a uh, in an area that's developing, frankly, quite quite quickly in in Seattle, it's kind of a, it's like the last remaining urban spot that something can happen. So there's a lot of ground up buildings that are happening in this area. This was a sliver site, basically 40 feet by 100 feet, classic infill site, and sort of a a, 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 a developing neighborhood. The idea of the place was uh, literally uh, a flat mm -hmm. uh, that would be used mostly for people in the art uh, field of some kind, either the fabrication, making of art, or actually the, the, the display, the, the collecting um, and gallery. And um, so these uh, large uh, steel doors, which everyone can see here, they, that was designed to accommodate large scale sculptural work, any sort of art making material. Can you say a bit, how they a bit about how they work? Well, they're just, um, very simply, they're just basically big hinges um, uh, that are collected into so what we call the world's largest hinge, but basically it's it's just a, a a series of doors and windows on the on the view side that are collected together in this this uh, very uh, simple uh, pipe hinge. And who lives there at this point? I mean, uh, this is an artist that that lives in 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 that particular uh, space. Uh, there's a couple of collectors that mm -hmm. are living there right now. People and who are making use of the uh, the the, the uh, unusual sort of uh, d uh, doors, and that also has a d a, a uh, cross ventilation function too. It, it? It, exactly, exactly. And living in Seattle, we're, we're in a relatively mild climate, so the conditioning of a space is is relatively easy. But th there are those special moments when you can just sort of open up the, the house basically to the, to the landscape, to the air. Right. And then you're also working on a slightly larger scale project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about? Yeah, this is, a, this is kind of interesting because I, uh, when I do lectures, I always talk about doing projects r uh, r in a relatively small scale because mm -hmm. I do think the residential scale is a, is a scale that architecture um, basically comes from, mm -hmm. right? It's the shelter, basically. It's, it's our core. It's our, it's, our, it's our beginning. And so to go to this next scale, this sort of mid-rise scale, or, um, and even in some cases a high-rise scale, is really an interesting jump for me. And is that something that you've done a lot of before? I mean, mm. you've worked on a, a couple, but you haven't done anything sort of ground up. No, and I think uh, just, a, you know, just barely starting, and you know, proof's in the pudding on how you sort of uh, take that, that experience and the, that sort of... Uh, focus on, on smaller scale and take it to the larger scale. Um, and how does that work here? 
That's an interesting question because it really is, it, it is a, um, on the smaller scale, you can kind of approach a project almost holistically because you can kind of understand it holistically. When you get into these larger projects, all of a sudden you're talking about the parts of this sort of larger piece. You can think about the parts holistically and how you sort of assemble those parts holistically. That's, I think that's the, that's the test, that's the next jump. So there's always gonna be some sort of reference to sort of human scale. That's, again, what we're all about. And then how do you take that, that human scale, that human touch, to that larger scale project. Can you tell us a bit about the program and how it works here? Well, in this case, uh, in, this, in this particular project, uh, the, this lower base part of the building is really about a five-story base. It basically references all of the existing historic uh, uh, scale of that street. And then the, the building above is a very simple base box of, of residential units. So it's basically a residential tower. And um, you know, we were talking about uh, materials and uh, you're the world's largest hinge. Um, <laughs> you've, uh, we recently featured on the cover. I happen to have one right here of uh, Snap, our product, mag our quarterly product magazine. Um, you you just started making a line of uh, hardware. Uh, why did you decide to do that? <laughs> Again, a natural extension of what we do um, as a business uh, in in residential work, of course it is, again, referencing the human scale. It, it really is the shelter, but it, those parts of the building that probably are the most important and the most intimate are those parts that you actually touch, feel, and move. So for us to now take it to the next step of actually doing those parts and pieces that, um, that you would touch and move and, and, and these, uh, I, and it's sort of an extension of your kind of a, a, a signature imprimatur that you put on a lot of projects is this kind of uh, industrial honesty to a lot of the, the door closures and things like that. You've always got uh, gears and chains and pulleys and gizmos, as, as you've called them before. Um, is this sort of an ex a brand extension of that? Uh, uh, how do they no, relate? I, you know, yeah. I don't know if it's a brand extension. <laughs> I, don't, I never saw the gizmos as really kind of a, a brand. I really th saw the gizmos more as a way of solving an architectural issue that okay. maybe happens as, as, a, as a building sort of evolves. Um, so just m my interest and my experience would, um, you know, would, al would allow us to sometimes do things using gears, levers, pulleys, chains, whatever, uh, to sort of do those things that we wanted to, or the client wanted to do. Um, and, but these definitely have an, ex, uh, an aesthetic kinship. Can you say a little bit about how they're? Well, it, it, it's sort of kind of an honesty of the materials that, are, that the, the parts and pieces are, are made out of. And certainly when they're gears and levers and pulleys, there's, there's a sort of an inherent uh, necessity that they have, a, they have sort of an honest function. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the, the function of function is, is actually, I think, beautiful. And actually, if you're trying to make something move or, or roll or whatever, um, just the honest, uh, sort of clear expression of that is, is probably the most uh, interesting thing. I mean, it's something for which you're really known too. Do you ever worry about it becoming a gimmick? Absolutely. Um, <coughs> and it, it, um, and it, it does worry me that uh, if a client would ask, uh, well, you know, we want a gizmo, uh, mm -hmm. it's a little uncomfortable. I, that's not really how it works, you know. You don't start with the gizmo and then, but it, um, but I, but they are fascinating. But they are fascinating puzzles to 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 solve. Uh, just like the accessories are just those parts of a building that are just fascinating. You know, if you think about the the, they're basically an extent extension of the geometry of your body. You know, and just to imagine that how how that works is is one of the most fascinating parts of what I get to do. But there's a playfulness to it, too. I mean, can you say a bit about the decision-making process, about putting these things into uh, the project, and now uh, other people can do sort of the same? Uh, well, uh, I don't, yeah, they're not intentionally playful, but they're intentionally kind of... Um, they're a lot of fun. They're a lot of fun, because in fact, movement and uh, the things that you move, the thing and the ability to movement, th there's sort of a wonder about that mm -hmm. ability, and so, uh, the playfulness probably just comes in in the fact that why not enjoy the thing that you're, you're experiencing? Why not enjoy the thing that you're moving uh, and in, in sort of a wonderful way? And certainly, if you move something large and use your own human sort of 
physics and geometry and, and um, it's sort of a wonderful thing to, to be able to participate in. Well, I'll, uh, I'll give one more plug to, uh, in the current issue of SNAP, uh, <laughs> you can read all about uh, the, uh, the hardware line. And uh, let's see, and we have, we have one more project to introduce um, this time out. The, can you tell us a bit about this uh, different kind of residential uh, scheme? That you've uh, the, yeah, this is the, the Pierre. Yeah. Uh, it's located in uh, Lopez um, Island in um, the San Juan Islands of uh, Washington. Which yeah. I've never had the pleasure of visiting, but can you say a little bit about the topography and the terrain? I mean, well, it's, really it's, it's just a it's, a, it's a classic sort of uh, island uh, sound with, a, with a, a sound with a bunch of islands in it. And basically it was underneath the glacier as it came from the north. So it was basically scraped down to the rock. So a lot of these islands have, have sort of these rock outcroppings. Um. And the idea here was to just take one of those rock, rock outcroppings and, and uh, literally uh, cut it into the, into the rock. I don't know if we can go back to the visual. So um, can you explain a little bit about how you did that? Um, about, uh, how, uh, the, about the approach to the house specifically too? It's well, it, it's a very traditional approach in the sense that traditionally our ancestors, if they, if they um, wanted to uh, um, build on a piece of property, they built on the least productive piece of property rather than on the on the most productive. So obviously the least productive part of this particular property was the was the rock itself. Okay. And then the idea was to then take that idea of building on this rock and use it actually as a quarry basically for uh, the building. So as we sculpted the rock and it sort of allowed the rock to tell us what was going to happen with the floor plan and what was going to happen with the section, as we took the rock and we repurposed that rock into the concrete, into the terrazzo floors, um, and then obviously we also left some parts and parts of the rock inside the house as a hearth and a master um, bathroom uh, vanity. Can you say a little bit more about the materials too, because they, they do really respond to that, um, well, to, to that incorporation of the, the rock from the site. Yeah, well, it, basically it's just a concrete, uh, basically a concrete uh, box kind of set into this uh, in, into this rock uh, with just steel windows, very simple, straightforward, and allowing with the way it was blasted, the way it was cut, the way it was drilled, we just allowed those um, uh, those those marks to kind of exist and sh and again shape shape the house as it as, devel as it developed. Well, fantastic. So, what are you working on right now? What's coming up next? I mean, you have the residential project that's sort of in, in uh, when when will the multifamily be complete? Oh, geez. Yeah, it's... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know it, it would be... Uh, Sorry, not to yeah, put you on the yeah. spot, but I mean, it's still <laughs> inside, but... Well, I think most of us in the in the profession realize that we're kind of uh, in a in sort of a, this interesting transitional period where we may be working on projects that may have a shelf life of a number of years, and, and we certainly are involved in some of those right now, where you may be uh, developing a project uh, maybe even to the point of being ready for construction um, and not knowing when, when that trigger might be pulled for the, mm -hmm. for the construction of the project. But there are a number of projects that we're working on, um, a lot of them fairly small. And again, I, I just want to make that point uh, clear, and I try to make that point clear in my lectures, is I really do think uh, the small projects, for me personally, are all maybe the most interesting because they do allow this sort of fast turnover to occur and they do y allow you to kind of holistically jump on these projects but also the small projects are um, I think the future uh, in many many ways the future of our, our pref profession or certainly a part of our our profession and they are terrific projects to uh, fill in those gaps between some of the larger projects mm -hmm. as they as they sort of come and go and, and wait and that's advice that you often give young designers to sort of uh, focus on smaller projects rather than these larger showpiece things just because the, as a portfolio building thing? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think in, w in a way the profession is, uh, has forgotten that the, the sort of smaller projects, the granular projects are sort of as important as sort of these large, large mega scale projects because they have, in some ways they have more uh, meaning, I think, to people's experience of the city. Uh, but in terms of a, of a portfolio builder, um, absolutely agree um, that um, if you're looking to um, sort of generate ideas, if you just have uh, sort of an, uh, 
a desire to just work on a lot of things with a lot of people in a lot of places, obviously the smaller projects are going to be um, an easier way to do, to do that. Well, I'm getting signals to wrap things up, but thank you so much for uh, joining us. And uh, again, you can read uh, about Char Charles Smith Wines uh, the, in our May issue and uh, the uh, Tom Can Dig uh, hardware line in the current issue of Snap. Actually, we do have a, a couple minutes. Uh, oh, does anybody do. have any questions? Okay. Uh, all right. Sure. Here, here, let, let me give you the microphone. <laughs> Well, I, I guess my question would be about the larger steel doors. Are you typically using uh, the same steel fabricator and shop to do those? Are you, are you sort of always recommending that guy because you have a good relationship and get the quality out of him? Or, or are you really working with different steel shops and producing that level uh, with different people? Um, we, we usually work with one steel fabricator uh, for the more complicated um, uh, geared devices. Uh, but that's changing. Um, there are more people interested in doing that and coming to us and uh, wanting to be involved in some of those those projects. But some of those big doors are actually fairly simple. Uh, they're not really devices. They're not really geared. Uh, and those are fabricated by any number of, of fabrication shops. So it's a... It, 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 it's only a, only to say to answer your question. We're working with a lot of different fabricators on on many of the doors. Some of the doors are very specific and special, and we still work with that one particular fabricator, uh, who's almost more of an engineer, industrial uh, designer fabricator. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I have one more question. Can you say a bit about the modeling process for the char for the uh, insert in the garage for the Charles Smith project? I mean that. It was also fairly simple, but I mean, uh, you use some pretty sophisticated uh, modeling strategies for uh, that. Uh, oh, I don't know if they're that sophisticated, but again, I think it's 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 a um, it's a future for us as a profession. Uh, where where basically our, I mean, we all know uh, with Revit and the sort of the, the the I think the power of Revit and what what that could ultimately lead to. So we're trying to. Uh, work closer and closer with a f uh, fabrication shop up in British Columbia to actually, as, as you might guess, take our drawings and almost completely seamlessly dr uh, uh, run them up there through the web and then it's fabricated up uh, in the web with computer, uh, computer devices and saws and uh, drills. So it's uh, basically that entire armadillo was built up in uh, uh, British Columbia, Nelson, British Columbia, and then shipped down and then sort of bolted into place. Great. Okay.